The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET and Blackboard webcast, Regular and Substantive Interaction, Context, Future, and Advice. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorships here at WCET. And we have a wonderful webcast and excellent presenters for you today. As we go along, please enter your questions into the question box. We'll hold those questions until the Q&A portion and then we'll get to your questions. If for some reason we can't get to all of your questions, we'll pull those out and share them with the presenters and get written responses back to you. The webcast is being recorded and we will send you a link to the recording as well as have it posted on our YouTube channel. The handout is available. If you click on the handout box, you can download a PDF file of the presentation. And feel free to ask questions or follow along with the hashtag WCET webcast in our Twitter feed. Today we'll move through some introductions, talk about the history and the background on the regulations, discuss the timeline on the OIG audit, hear what CBIN and the University of Wisconsin Extension are doing, and then we'll get to your Q&A and conclusion. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and we'll be sure to watch and hold those until the last portion unless if there's a question that we need to interrupt the panelists for, we will certainly do that. Our moderator today is my colleague Russ Poulin, who's the Director of Policy and Analysis here at WCET. Take it away, Russ. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. And just a, a brief word about the, the session that, uh, remember the, the issue of regular and substantive interaction that really is based in uh, fraudulent activities that happened back in 1992, and I think uh, we'll be saying more about that. But, but in looking at what we want to try to accomplish today, we wanted to give you some context about the history, what has happened, and certainly the, uh, uh, the report, the audit report for Western Governors University is something that brings us to the fore again. Um, WGU is adamant that uh, they have done uh, nothing, nothing wrong, and so we'll wait to see what the Department of Education rules in terms of the recommendations on that, on that report. But what we want to do really is to uh, uh, put w, putting WGU aside is to give our members uh, the background and then some advice in terms of what they should be looking for, how this might how to, how this might affect all of you. And then also we want to spend a lot of time at the end um, getting into any questions that you have. So we've asked the uh, uh, presenters all to be uh, um, brief so that we do have time at the end for your questions. So start thinking of those questions now. And for our presenters, just uh, why we've uh, selected these folks. Van Davis, uh, uh, you've noted, has been uh, writing uh, blogs with me on this issue and his background. Uh, that when he was with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board was working on CBE issues and has uh, followed this topic uh, closely. Uh, we uh, uh, also uh, asked uh, our friend uh, uh, Laura Pedrick to, to come on uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, with the things that they're doing with the flex option there and uh, what's going on. And then she asked to have her financial aid lifeline and Melissa uh, to join her to make sure that she doesn't go off the uh, off the path in terms of any uh, financial aid questions. And then speaking of uh, financial aid, very pleased to have Amanda Sharp uh, from NASFA, the uh, National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, to give us some background because it really is, uh, uh, you can get in the weeds and all this uh, financial aid stuff and to give us some uh, context about uh, what is happening and what is going on. With that, I'm going to turn it to our first presenter, Van, uh, to take it from here. Thank you, Van. Thanks a lot, Russ. Um, so, Megan, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Russ mentioned is that this has a long history, and um, that's what I want to try to to lay out because I think the history matters in terms of our conversations of of where we are today. And regular and substantive is. I, I've been watching a lot of 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 Marvel and DC movies lately. And I'm struck that every, uh, every movie, every hero, every villain has a backstory. They have an origin story. And so we can think of this as the origin story. 
of regular and substantive. It starts in the 1980s, as Russ mentioned. Um, there were grave concerns over the issue of fraud with correspondence courses, especially um, with the use of GI bills, uh, GI bill benefits. And so in 1992, um, we see this definition of a correspondence course that is put into statute. A course provided by an institution under which the institution provides instructional materials by mail or electronic transmission, including examinations on the materials to, and here's the important part, students who are separated from the instructor. Interaction between the instructor and student is limited, is not regular and substantive. So here is the origin of that phrase, regular and substantive, and is primarily initiated by the student. Correspondence courses are typically self-paced. So this is the first time that we see this phrase um, enter into the legal lexicon. Challenge is, you know, it's not defined. And it's only talked about in terms of correspondence courses. So something is correspondence if it is not regular and substantive. I can make it if you can move to the next slide. Now, this creates a problem in the, late, in the 1990s, especially the late 1990s. Some of y'all have been around for a while. You may remember that in 1998, we had the Distance Education Demonstration Project. And as distance education began to explode in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this recognition that we needed to make sure that they were going to be eligible for financial aid. And so now we see the definition of distance education course um, enter into statute. And so it's being defined. Distance education means education that uses one or more of the technologies listed um, to deliver instruction to students who are separated from the instructor. Same thing as correspondence, separated from the instructor. But here's where it differs. And to support regular and substantive interaction between the student and the instructor, either synchronously or asynchronously. So this is the second time that we have this phrase, regular and substantive, show up in the legal lexicon. First time was with correspondence, and we sort of defined what it wasn't, or we, we said that it's correspondence if there's not regular and substantive. Now we're defining distance education, and we're saying, well, it's distance education if it is regular and substantive, and it goes on and lists some technologies that can be used for that. The challenge is, we still don't have a definition of what regular and substantive is. So it's the key indicator between whether or not something is correspondence or distance ed, but we still don't know what it is. And why is that important? Well, as Amanda is gonna talk about later, it's, it's the linchpin for whether or not something is really going to be eligible for financial aid. Next slide, please. So how is it then that, um, the Department of Education has tried, since we don't have a definition of regular and substantive in, um, in legislation or in law and statute, how has the department tried to provide um, direction uh, and advice around what regular and substantive is? Well, there's been a couple of dear colleague letters that are particularly important here. The first happened in March 2011. So, what it said was, it started with, some of y'all may remember this one, um, that letter starts with defining what a week of instructional time is. Seven day period and at least one day of regularly scheduled instruction, so there's that regular again, or examination occurs. Uh, and then it says that, thus in a seven day period, a student is expected to be academically engaged. And then it gives some examples of how that might manifest itself. Classroom attendance, examinations, practica, laboratory work, internships, supervised studio work. Next slide, please. So we get an idea of what the regular is here. Um, and it's tied to what a week of instruction is. But then we further get an idea that in the case of distance ed, here's what substantive interaction might look like. It can include, but is not limited to. Submitting an academic assignment, taking an exam, an interactive tutorial or computer assisted instruction, attending a study group that was assigned by the institution, contributing to an academic online discussion, 
and initiating contact with a faculty member to ask a question about the academic subject studied in the course. So we've got a little bit of an idea here what regular might be. We've got a little bit of an idea here about what substantive might be. There's one other dear colleague letter leading up to the WGU audit that's important for this conversation. And that's the one that happened in December of 2014. Um, and Laura may end up talking a little bit more about this one. This is where, this one is, is specifically discussing competency-based education. And here's where it starts getting really interesting. We do not consider interaction that is wholly optional or initiated primarily by the student to be regular and substantive interaction between students and instructors. So again, we've got a little bit of an idea of what it might be. Now we've got an idea of what it might not be. And then if you can move to the next slide, Megan. But then it goes on, and here's the kicker. It then lists what might be regular and substantive interactions in a competency-based education course, but then quickly says, but we're not going to guarantee this. And what might it be? Participating in regularly scheduled learning sessions, where there's an opportunity for direct interaction, submitting an academic assignment, taking an exam, interactive tutorial or computer assisted instruction, attending a study group that is assigned by the institution. This should be sounding a little familiar. Participating in an online discussion, consultation with a faculty mentor to discuss academic course content, participation in faculty guided independent study. So the challenge that we're left with here is that we have this term regular and substantive interaction that is absolutely critical in defining what's correspondence and what's distance education. But in statute, it's never defined. And the guidance given by the Department of Education is squishy um, and never clearly defined. And then that leads us to what just recently happened with Western Governors University and the Inspector General's audit that was recently came out. And so in this audit, what we see is um, the Inspector General's office, which remember is independent of the Department of Education, so they're not the folks that wrote those dear colleague letters, but we see the Inspector General also struggling with defining regular and substantive interaction. And the solution they come to is that they're going to take the ordinary, and that's their language, the ordinary meaning of regular and substantive interaction. And here's how they define it in the Western Governor's Audit. Substantive interaction is defined as relevant to the subject matter and involves a student interaction with a course mentor or required an individual submission of a performance task for which an evaluator provided the student feedback. Now, this is actually different than what we saw on that previous slide in the Dear Colleague letters. And it's different because of this last little phrase here, evaluator provided the student feedback. So now we've got the Inspector General giving their interpretation of what substantive means using this ordinary meaning. Um, and then, next slide, please. They further go on and say that substantive interaction is defined as relevant to the subject matter, involves a student interaction with a course mentor, or required an individual submission of a performance task for which an evaluator provided the student feedback. Like I said, this is a little different. Remember before, we had some automated work that could be considered um, regular interaction. Now or substantive interaction. Now the IG is saying, yeah, no, you absolutely have to have interaction between a student and a faculty member. And then here's where they begin to try to define regular. And this is important. Regular is defined as ensure that the school defined academic year will include at least 30 weeks of instructional time and each of the weeks will include at least one day of regularly scheduled instruction or an examination. And this is their ordinary meaning of regular. So this is, in, this is fairly significant. Um, the WGU audit report, of course, is couched within the um, 
context of competency-based education, but when you look at the ordinary meanings, or what they're defining as the ordinary meanings of regular and substantive here, you see that this goes far beyond just competency-based education. This really applies to all of distance education, and they are taking a different set of definitions than what we've really seen before in the Dear Colleague letters. Next slide. The audit report goes on and, again, sort of defines in the negative. It says that um, substantive does not include computer-generated feedback on objective assessments. As I said, this seems to be a bit of a shift. Recorded webinars, videos, and reading materials if the course design materials did not require the student to watch and interact with an instructor. So there we see that interaction piece again. Contact with mentoring staff who are not directly providing instruction on the course's subject material. Next slide, please. So what we have there is the sort of whirlwind origin story for this three-word phrase, regular and substantive forward phrase, regular and substantive interaction, that we now see is at the heart of probably one of the biggest um, set of challenges that distance education has faced in its short history. And with that, I will uh, turn it back to Russ. Thank, thank you, and, uh, and we do have some really good questions. And one, one thing that I see that we're going to uh, need to do and that we'll, we'll uh, pledge to do is that for some of these things that we'll provide some uh, links, and I've already put one out there for, for definitions, but just uh, some links to where they can uh, find some of these things. And so Van and Amanda, and, and uh, we'll work together to get something out that we'll email out to everybody who's registered for this afterwards. Does that work out for you, Van? Yep, not a problem at all. And, and I, I think uh, we also can um, connect, we can also point people back to the uh, blog posts that you and I recently did too that also lays all of this out with uh, links to the documents. Yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of those links go, go back there. So if you go to wctfrontiers.org and look back to our last few that uh, we do have a lot of these uh, links in there, but we'll we'll work out something on, on some of these questions as well. And then um, and just a couple of questions uh, for you, Van. Uh, one from uh, Esperan Esperanza Zenon, who I'm going to murder her name, uh, is that does this mean that we have to meet face to face at some point to have this type of interaction? Well, so I, I should have prefaced all of this by saying, despite my mother's best wishes, I am not a lawyer, nor do I play one on television. Um, so I would say that you would want to talk to um, the folks on your campus that deal with accreditation issues. I don't think we do. I mean, that, that my interpretation is that, that you don't have to have uh, a face-to-face -face, um, meeting, that they're, it, it's not requiring to do that. Um, but it does sort of raise these issues of, well, you know, how do you track all of this and, and, and how do you end up reporting all of this should you be audited? Okay. And then let me ask one more and then we'll go to, uh, to Amanda. And that's about one day of interaction. And they say that clearly they don't, they don't mean a 24 hour, hour day. What does one day mean? You know, I, I wish I had an answer to that. Clearly, they don't mean a 24-hour day. I, I think what they mean is that there has to be, and again, this is, you know, there, there's, there's ambiguity here. Um, the way I interpret it is that they mean that there has to be um, a class period or a, and, and period's even hard to say because that sort of connotates that it's, a time when everyone's meeting, but there has to be some sort of session, um, learning session during the week. So there has to be sort of one learning session. Yeah, I think that's how I would take it as well, is that not that you met for 24 hours, but that during a, something happened during AD during that week is how I interpret it. And so with that, I'm going to let you off the hook. And then uh, uh, Inger Stark has the question that sets up Amanda for her section. And her question is, do you know and can you clarify the difference between a program review by the Department of Ed and possibly subsequent audits? And then also I'll throw in the, the WGU audit uh, from, from the, uh, uh, that, that was out there as well. And so 
Amanda is going to help us out with the differences and all those and where you might get caught on this. So Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you, Russ, for having me. And um, yeah, did she, is she a planted question to set me up? Because that was just perfect. Um, if we could go ahead to the next slide and talk about a review and what is a review, what does it mean? And uh, go ahead to the next slide, Megan. Before I talk a lot about uh, the U.S. Department of Education program reviews, I want to back up just a second and talk about what is a program. For those of you who are not in the financial aid office, program probably means academic program to you. To us financial aid nerds, a program is the Title IV programs at your school. And what a Title IV program is, is basically just an umbrella term we use for all of the aid programs that were authorized under the HEA, under Title IV of the HEA, which is the Higher Education Act. And so that's just a term that we use to encompass all of those rather than trying to list them all off. But some of those include the Federal Pell Grant Program, Direct Loan Program, Teach Grant, um, Federal Work Study, among others. So that is the type of program review that the United States Department of Education is going to do if they do a review. They are going to come in and see how is your institution administering those programs. And the school participation division, which is a part of the department, they will identify the purpose and scope of that review. Uh, what kind of review are they going to do? Again, what is the scope? whether it will be an on-site review or off-site, where they just request that you send them documents and they re review it off-site. Um, what is the timing? What about staffing? Uh, they may have uh, staff needs while they're on your campus. They may need to set up interview times with staff on your campus, so staffing would come into play. And also, how long do they expect the review to take? Uh, we can go ahead and move forward. Uh, the department also has several kinds of program reviews, and again, the uh, school participation division will identify the type of review, of review that you would be subjected to. General assessment program review is the most common. However, there are several types, as you see here, and the 2017 program review guide would give you a lot more information, in-depth information about what each of these types of reviews looks at. Um, there is a link to that, and I believe the link is live in your handout if you want to take a look at the program review guide later and just see what those different types mean. All right, we can go forward. Timing. All right, the School Participation Division will notify you in advance of a program review. How far in advance? Well, that could vary. <laughs> they usually try to give you two to four weeks in advance. However, they may give shorter notice if they have some reason to think that they shouldn't give advance notice. I would think that would be rare and in cases where they suspected something going on that was not good. So usually you're going to get several weeks of advance notice. And that pretty much sums up program reviews. This is different from an Office of Inspector General or OIG audit. Um, the OIG is independent of the Department of Education, and they have the authority to audit any program that relates to the ED programs and operations, including ED. Okay, but what you're probably most concerned with are the external audits that they perform for um, entities that do receive Department of Ed funding, and that would be, in your situation, schools and universities, colleges who are being subjected to the OIG audits. And they come in looking for problems, compliance problems, weaknesses, and then they make recommendations to the Department of Education. The OIG audit is not the end, it's just the beginning. And they pass that information on to the department to take a look at. Again, I've got a link for you there to the OIG audit services. Uh, you can take a look if you want to know more about the different audits that they that they do provide in their other functions. All right, okay, so we talked about the kinds of audits, and so going back to what Van talked about, I'm gonna try to give you a little bit more background on some of the regulatory definitions. Uh, let's go ahead. And these really are specific to WGU's audit and, and the problems that they ran into on their audit. Uh, one of the conditions for institutional eligibility 
is found here in 34 CFR 600.7. And for an institution to be eligible, if uh, let's move forward one, Megan, and it'll highlight that for us. Okay, an institution will not be an eligible institution if more than 50% of their courses were correspondence courses or 50% or more of the students enrolled, their regularly enrolled students were enrolled in correspondence courses. The important thing here is to note that this is or, it's either or. So if you don't, um, if you don't meet these criteria, if you have more than 50% of your courses considered correspondence, or more than 50% of your students are enrolled in one of those courses, then your institution isn't eligible to participate in the Title IV programs. Um, and so if you're not eligible to participate, any A you may have dispersed to students during that period which you were not eligible, you weren't eligible to, dis to disperse. So that is the thing that we, we're kind of running into with the WGU audit. All right, let's move to the next slide. So that, that is kind of the crux of this finding. Because of the way that OIG defined correspondence versus distance learning that Van talked about, because they found that the definition wasn't met here, that the courses at WGU were considered correspondence courses and that 62% of their students were enrolled in one or more of those courses. When that happened, they didn't meet that regulatory threshold and so based on their finding, they considered WGU to be ineligible for participation in the Title IV programs, and therefore all of the aid that they had dispersed during the time period covered by that audit, they, they were not eligible to disperse. And so that's the biggie right there. Okay, we can move forward. So now that the OIG audit has been done, as I said, that's not the end, that's the beginning. The department has time to respond. OIG makes the recommendations, and then the department will issue a final audit determination. They're going to look at the report from OIG. They're going to look at the school's response. They're going to take input from the program and from the OIG staff, and then they are going to issue their final audit determination. Once that's done, the, the school is still given an opportunity to appeal uh, any financial liabilities. All right, next slide. Uh, in general, there's a six-month time frame for issuance of that final audit determination, but um, that can be affected by several things. Some examples are listed there. So oftentimes that means that the audit determination doesn't occur during that six-month time frame. It may be beyond that. And from what we see, that's more often the case, that, that it does take longer than six months. And I know that there are probably some schools out there that are still waiting. So. This is just a general guideline. Next slide. And before this webcast, I, I reached out to a couple of folks at the Department of Education just to ask them if they had anything they could share with me um, that would be helpful in this webcast to help you better know what you should be doing to stay in compliance. And the response that I was given is that the OIG audit does not reflect any change in the department's current guidance regarding regular and substantive interaction. And the guidance found in the Dear Colleague letter, Gen 1423, Van referred to it, and there is a link to it in your handout as well, um, that that is still the current guidance and institutions should still follow that guidance. Although it may not be completely clear, that is the only guidance right now that in existence. And, and really what is happening here is that regulation isn't keeping up with technology. So we have definitions like you were talking about earlier, the um, uh, one week of instructional time. Well, those, those regulations were written at a time when most interaction and most instruction occurred in a classroom, a physical classroom. So there's some catching up to do there, and, and the department realizes that, but that is not, we don't have anything other than this dear colleague letter right now. All right, so next slide. Uh, just wrapping it up, and to why does this matter for you? Well, our concern at NASPA is really that this might stifle 
schools who are looking into innovative learning models, who are really interested in, in ways to move forward and using technology to better help their students. But with findings like you've seen with WGU and the OIG report, uh, this could make you um, afraid of what you might run into, afraid of making a mistake and doing something wrong, or even just the hassle of, of the whole thing. So that is our worry, is that this may have an effect on schools who would like to move into this area, but are now kind of hesitant to do so. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Russ. Amanda, great. Thanks mm -hmm. so much for that. And I'm, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions here as well. We're getting just great great questions and far more than we can answer in this time. And we'll try to uh, look back through these and uh, uh, give responses out. When we send out those links, we'll try to get some responses back to uh, uh, to many, if not all of these uh, that we can. And then so a question for you uh, about that word disperse. It says, so if you're not eligible to disperse, what does that mean? The school has to send the money back or, or say a bit more about that. Okay. Um, well, when you disperse aid, basically we're just meaning pay the, pay the financial aid to the student. So in, in this particular scenario where um, the OIG has found, based on their finding, they don't believe that WGU was eligible to participate in the Title IV programs at all. So because of that, any aid they paid to students during the period of that review they were not eligible to pay to any of those students. And that's why the, you saw the really enormous um, finding of the amount they had to, that had to be returned. I mean, normally in, a, in just a typical school setting, if you have a student who is ineligible, a student, then you can't pay them any aid or disperse any aid. In this case, they're saying the entire school was not eligible to participate, so no aid should have been paid. And that is according to OIG. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, Cynthia Rockwell asks a question, which I think is key to probably the vast majority of institutions that are that are on here. And so, uh, so let's say that her institutions, that their online courses were all deemed to be correspondence courses. However, less than 50% of the students and less than 50% of the courses overall for the institution were correspondence courses. Are they still, okay? is their financial aid program still Okay. Yes, uh, assuming they meet all other program eligibility requirements, sure. um, which there are a lot and they're all found in 34 CFR 600. Um, yes, so those are the thresholds. 50% or more of your courses are considered correspondence or 50% or more of your students are enrolled in a correspondence course. So if you, aren't, if you aren't hitting either of those thresholds, if you're under 50% on both of those, then that particular problem or a particular regulation is not your problem, then you would have to go on and make sure you're meeting all the other program eligibility requirements. Excellent, yeah, because I think I see a lot of misunderstanding about that because they think, they're starting to think that just any of their courses that are correspondence that they lose aid, but it really has to be pretty substantial to reach that 50%, yes. Work, yes. right? Yes, it does, and that's why it ties in and why it's so important that the definition of distance education versus correspondence education become very clearly defined so schools can be certain that the courses they're offering won't be classified as correspondence if that's not what they intend them to be. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, we'll let you rest for the moment and we'll move <laughs> to our friends from the uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And Melissa is going to uh, uh, come out of the shoot and tell us about uh, more about financial aid. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a bit of a tough act to follow, but I am going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the University of Wisconsin Flexible Option Programs. A little bit about us. It's a unique system-wide effort where the whole University of Wisconsin system is participating. Um, not all campuses are participating at this point, but the way that it's functioning is that all of the institutions that would like to participate um, have faculty teaching coursework. The same faculty that teach it on their campuses are also teaching it in our programs that are uh, competency-based in distance education programs. And then the administration of the programs is being done in a central office. Um, if you could go to the next slide. This gives you some key points about what these types of programs are. They are designed to be um, 
in parallel to the standard term, what we might call regular brick and mortar modality programs. Um, however, these programs are competency-based, direct assessments, they're distance education. Uh, we use a non-term academic year. We use subscription periods, which means that the student can enroll for a particular period of time and work on as much coursework as they would like during that period of time. Um, and the students all set a personalized pace. Um, each of these terminologies has its own definition and regulations that have to be followed, and um, so finding the balance can be tricky at times. Uh, several of them do include the regulation for regular and substantive faculty-initiated interaction. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, a little bit about that terminology and how we are utilizing it here. Um, often when this term comes up, it's mistaken as a financial aid only rule. It is related to financial aid for certain, but it isn't necessarily only related to financial aid. As you saw in the slides earlier, the Office of Inspector General is getting involved and the Department of Education as well. Um, sort of financial aid is the carrot and the stick here a little bit, but it's not the only purpose for having regular and substantive interaction. Um, it must be built in as part of the academic program. So there really has to be a large partnership between financial aid, student services, academic uh, leadership, faculty, um, all of that, uh, all of those people are involved. Um, and in, the program itself and the coursework itself must have um, an easy way built into it for faculty-initiated student interaction. Um, if you would go to the next slide. In addition to doing all of that as part of the program, we've also built in regular check-ins um, at a regular interval, which are initiated by the faculty related specifically to the academic content of each course. Um, and of course, we call that a competency set, not a course, but it's equivalent. Um, it's also something that's required in order to continue in the course or in the competency set work, um, thereby making it not optional. And it involves robust personalized feedback from the faculty on each of those interactions. So that's just a bit about what we're doing here with our regular and substantive interaction. And Laura Pedrick is going to speak to uh, a little bit more about what we're doing. Thanks, Melissa. Could we go to the next slide, please? So currently, there are seven institutions offering direct assessment, competency-based education programs. And direct assessment is what I call the fullest expression of a CBE design. And um, that's seven out of you know, thousands of higher ed institutions. And yet based on, um, there is a wonderful organization, uh, CBEN, the Competency-Based Education Network, which really functions as a peer organizational learning organization. Um, based on attendance at CBEN's annual conference, there are hundreds of institutions that are interested in adopting CBE. It's a very promising educational model uh, for delivery. Um, assessment results are showing promising results here at UWM. Our nursing program did a study comparing um, critical thinking using um, value rubrics, uh, AAC and U value rubrics, uh, comparing students in a traditional online, it's kind of weird to now be talking about traditional and online together, but traditional online versus uh, flex option, same uh, program, same faculty, same learning materials. And our flex option students did uh, perform at a higher level. So, and I know other programs nationally are starting to see results like this. And we are, in fact, reaching a new student market that increases access to higher education. Our students think about a traditional online class. There are papers due at certain on certain dates, exams on certain dates, requirements to post at certain intervals. In a flex option mode of delivery, students pace them. They, they, it's a personalized pace that uh, can work for students. We've made it easy for students to step in and step out. That's kind of designed into the educational experience. We have, um, in addition to 
robust and frequent contact with faculty. We have dedicated academic success coaches who support the students. So, so this is, again, very promising, but uh, as others have commented, these recent developments with WGU really do have the potential to slow growth and stifle innovation and access. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Megan? So, and again, a point others have made, uh, the OIG audit does affect all of distance education, not just CDE. And, and for this slide, I'm sort of channeling uh, C. Ben and, and its director, Sharla Long. Uh, Competency-based education is extremely, very has a lot of variability within it, including face-to-face -face and blended approaches. There is a direct assessment program on welding, for example, that is uh, blended and has a face-to-face -face component. So what is really needed, uh, I believe it was Van earlier who talked about this negative definition of, of competency-based education, that it's defined more by what it isn't rather than what it is. And so really what's needed is a positive statutory definition of CBE that reconciles some of the murkiness of the previous guidance. Uh, we do need to retain uh, safeguards to ensure that there are high quality learning experiences for students, that students have access to faculty, that fraud is not committed and so forth. But these regulations really also need to have scope for innovations in learning science and uh, recognize that students may have um, at different points, different needs for faculty interaction and, and the potential to leverage newer educational technologies such as adaptive learning uh, should not be a dis there shouldn't be a disincentive for um, helping students progress through programs, show mastery, and, and get degrees. Uh, so uh, at the institution, those are kind of federal level recommendations. At the institutional level, uh, CBEN had a, a quality task force, and they developed qual a quality framework for competency-based programs uh, that provides standards for design and delivery. The link is right below. This is a very, very rich and detailed document that a number of people worked on who are in the trenches on CBE. And I really do um, encourage you to look at that document. There is a quality standard around intentionally designed and engaged learner experiences that does address some of the student-faculty interaction points that we've discussed in, in this webcast. And I think uh, you know very much this is an evolving field, but if our national goals are to increase access to higher education, to turn the corner on the 21st century knowledge-based econ knowledge economy, we really can't leave something as promising as CBE and, in fact, all of distance education um, in the, a position of regulatory murkiness. And that's, that's my last point on that slide. Excellent. Um, uh, thank you all. And I guess what, while we're, uh, while we're uh, with you here, and uh, for Melissa and, and Laura, that we had several questions that had to do with, uh, about uh, uh, specifically the ER program. What, what are examples of easy ways for faculty to initiate student in, in interaction for your uh, flex programs or uh, there's another question about what what are examples of check-ins being used uh, uh, in your in your flex program? If you could talk about some of, some of those. So um, I will just say that our faculty um, thinking on this kind of evolved over time and um, used um, assessment to look at what was leading to meaningful questions and responses from students. Uh, we offer prim primarily a project-based uh, qualitative assessment strategy. Um, the faculty uh, in the different programs came together and really um, looked at the students' progression as, as, a de as developmental in nature. So when they proactively reach out, they are um, asking some different questions, like a stable of questions around um, the early engagement with the academic content, um, and then as they're deeper into the kind of, in sort of what is their plan for tackling this, and then providing individualized feedback on that plan, then uh, when they're deeper into the subject matter, um, 
questions designed to elicit deeper learning and thoughtful reflection and then um, sort of summative reflection and uh, a little bit more holistically, how does this fit into your learning path globally when it's toward the end of engagement with a particular competency set or, or course? Uh, Melissa, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, I think that was a great summary, Laura. It's really a, a way to gauge the student's understanding along the way, um, see if they need any additional resources, um, things of that nature. Great, great, okay. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna, uh, Van, I think this one is for you, that we had several questions early on about asynchronous discussions and asynchronous video. And uh, so if you could expand on both of those about, you know, do, uh, how, when is it that asynchronous discussions, uh, how do they fit these definitions? And also if I have an asynchronous video where there's no opportunity for interaction, how do they fit, how do they fit into this? Well, and again, this is all very fuzzy. Um, there's nothing to me as I read it, there's nothing that indicates that there's a problem with asynchronous um, conversation. But the, what certainly the Inspector General seems to be coming back to and what the Dear Colleague letters seem to be coming back to is this idea of interaction. Now, I think the, the sort of issue of asynchronous video where a student is not having any interaction with a faculty member is a bit fuzzier. Um, it could probably, at least the way that I look at it, it could probably be read either way. Um, so I think that, that, you know, much like what Laura just talked about, what everyone seems to be coming back to is this issue of, and this question of, how do we define interaction? Is there interaction taking place? And is that an interaction that has substance to it, academic substance, um, and not just a casual interaction? Okay, okay, that sounds good. And, then, and I know we've had some questions about, you know, the quality of interaction, all these sorts of things. And I'm not, this is my opinion. I'm not sure that they're all interested in that. They're interested in something that they can count and that they've decided that they can count things from the faculty person. And so that we've presented some other alternatives and then we, uh, that have to do around assessments and uh, with academic, they, they define academic activity very well. There, there it seems like there's things around academic activities that they could be counting to show that the student is progressing and that fraud is not, not happening as well. So I don't know if uh, um, either Amanda or, or Van care to, care to comment on that. Well, I mean, I'd just say, I think one of the things that's interesting is when you really dig into the um, OIG's audit of Western governors, there's two things that, that stood out. Um, one is what they looked at was curr were curriculum materials. They did a few interviews but they primarily were looking at the curriculum to see did the curriculum show that there was supposed to be regular and substantive interaction. The other thing that stood out is at one point the, the inspector general was, was pretty blunt in saying that they did not look at nor were they concerned about quality. So it, there's certainly not been any attempts, I think, to define quality in all of this conversation, which is one of the great things about the CBIN standards is, and that Laura was talking about, is that CBIN has come out and worked on a set of standards that indicate here's where we think quality is and how it should be defined. And that's kind of independent of this idea of regular and substantive interaction. Great, great. We, uh, we, uh, uh, well, let's see, I'll move on. And so uh, we do have some questions about some of the links that were in the uh, uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee uh, and what they're what they're doing. And so we, as we said before, that we'll take links and then send those out to you uh, afterwards. Or uh, uh, as we're doing this, uh, Megan may be able to find them and put them into the answer box uh, if you could find that question. Uh, but I do have some very specific questions for Amanda about. Uh, uh, how some of this works. And the uh, the first one is that are students who take 
correspondence courses, are they eligible for financial aid or, or should I say under what circumstances are they eligible for financial aid? They are eligible for financial aid. There is some limitation as far as their cost of attendance and the cost that can be included in, um, in that cost of attendance and that's kind of getting into the weeds of awarding financial aid, but yes, they are eligible. Okay, and then that just get, that gets us into the next question where where then the institution, as you know, as you described that the financial aid program for the institution runs into trouble in being able to uh, give aid when uh, it has this, that, those 50% thresholds. And we had a yes. very good question from Mark Lentini about, is that an and or an or? Is it fi both 50% courses or and 50% enrollments and or or? No, it is or. It is or. So you could theoretically have less than 50% of your courses that were uh, correspondence courses, but if more than 50% of your students are enrolled in one of those courses, then you would not be eligible. So it is an or. Very That's good. A very yeah, good it's, point. <laughs> it's a very good point. Very big difference. That, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that was the finding at WGU. I don't believe the finding was that more than half of their courses were correspondence, but more than 62% of their students were right. enrolled in one of those courses so that they got the second part of that. So you could have a few courses with large enrollments and sure. you're in trouble. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see that this is one, this is a question for Melissa uh, in the UW Flex options. It uh, was stated that the interactions was required to continue in the course. Uh, can you expand on this a little more and the impact this might have on the students, either with uh, financial aid uh, or academic implications? Uh, also, how frequently uh, does this have to be addressed in any given amount of time? Um, uh, <clears throat> I would be happy to talk about that a little bit more. It's uh, still an evolving process for us and we're still um, defining exactly what that means and how that's going to play out and what the implications of it are. So there are still some uh, things for us to consider. Um, the student, the, the general idea is the student would need to complete that um, process before they would be able to submit further assessments and complete the coursework for the projects. Um, it does have implications in that if the student is no longer actively engaged, as we talked about um, earlier in, in some of the slides, there are financial aid implications to when they're considered withdrawn from the course. So that would have a lot of impact on the student's progress forward. So we do need to be in contact with the student. We have, um, Laura mentioned, our academic success coaches that can reach out to the students, make sure that they are aware of the deadlines. We have a lot of communication with them about staying on track. And um, we do have a process where we can have some flexibility for the student who had an emergency come up or something to that effect. Someone who may have uh, been hospitalized, for example. And um, so we have a little bit of room for, for life to happen as it does. Okay, okay, excellent, okay. Uh, let's see, for for this one, let's see, uh, probably for Van, back back to you, that John Schopert has uh, posted this one twice, so let's go ahead and ask it for him. And that is, uh, is there a, a rubric that uh, the education department or the OIG uses that measures uh, uh, sub substantive interaction um, that's initiated by the faculty each week, as in, uh, for example, as in one faculty uh, initiated interaction per week? Not to my knowledge. Which is probably one of the things that makes this so fun. <laughs> yeah, so, so there isn't a big rubric, but they do have sort of these guidelines. Now, you did talk about the something has to happen once a, right. once a week. Is that right? So we do have that, but beyond that, there's it's pretty absent of other guidelines. Is, is that what you're saying? And that's, that's correct. Week, wasn't the once a week in the WGU audit as opposed to it was. your colleague letters? So 
So that that's that's actually new uh, guidance, and yet the response that Amanda got from Ed was Department of Ed was it's all consistent, and so um, with the dear colleague letter. So there are some perplexing things about the guidance that has been issued to date. Ron, we've well, seen that all. Think, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think one of the things that we're running into here um, is that there, I mean, the, uh, the inspector general functions independently of the Department of Education and the secretary. They make recommendations. Ultimately, it's up to the Department of Ed and the Secretary to determine whether or not they accept those recommendations. Um, I think what we've seen for a number of years now is that there is a difference in opinion um, between the Inspector General's office and the Department of Education's office when it comes to how one looks at innovative and non-traditional delivery models uh, with financial aid. And so that's part of the tension that I think we're picking up on here as well is that there's not agreement or consistency within the department. This is Melissa. I think something along those lines as well is the regulations and some of these things that were defined were defined a long time ago with the standard programs in mind. So the definition of a week is in financial aid regulation in regard to the definition of a credit hour and an academic year, and that's all tied together. And what competency-based and direct assessment programs do is completely um, jump away from the defined academic year and credit hour. And so it's hard, you know, we often use the term fitting a square peg in a round hole uh, when we're describing what it is we're trying to accomplish here and what we're trying to, to do because we want to follow these regulations to the best of our ability, but it, they are a little bit limiting in, in innovation because of that. Um, so the, the definition of an academic year, and part of the reason we went with a non-term program here is because it's a little bit more personalized to the student and individualized in terms of um, when the interaction takes place and how that's defined. I know that was and, a little and to sort of, financial aid, but go ahead, Pam, sorry. Well, and, and to piggyback on that, I mean, we're, this, this exactly is the challenge, that all of these things have been defined at a time well before we started really beginning to see what can happen with new delivery models. Um, ideally, this would be taken care of when the Higher Education Act is reauthorized because that's the omnibus bill that we always use to make these changes and to update our policies. The challenge that we have, though, is that the Higher Education Act is well overdue to be reauthorized, and there's no indication it's going to be reauthorized in the next one or two years. And so without special legislation or negotiated rulemaking, we're all sort of stuck in this position of there being that sort of inconsistency and lack of clarity and the mechanism we would usually use to fix that isn't available for us to use right now. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to, ha I'm going to have to uh, uh, cut us off. There's a questions about mentors that I wanted to get to and a definition of mentors uh, and, and how that works. And then uh, but I do want to uh, chime in here and saying that in my following this uh, this whole issue ever since the same area of the woods uh, uh, findings from uh, less than five, six years ago uh, now that uh, it, it seems like these definitions, you know, keep keep morphing over, over time. And it makes it in, in my final say will be that it makes it very uh, difficult for institutions to comply with a, um, a somewhat moving target. Now, a lot of the definitions have been there for a while, but it's not been laid out very well or uh, uh, articulately by the um, by the department. With that, uh, there were some questions about. Uh, we have a lot of questions that are left. We're going to try to address those. There was a question about. Uh, we will put out the slides for this. We will put out some links for this. Uh, we also will uh, take questions that we answered within the box because there's some of those that I've been working on, and we'll we'll get those out to you as well. Um, join me in thanking the panelists on this and, and all of you that were here. 
with that, I'm going to turn it back to our friend uh, Megan to close us out. Wow, this was such a worthwhile presentation. Thank you all for your contributions, the excellent questions and conversation that took place. Do note that all of the resources that we will share with you will be distributed directly via email. And we have a lot of wonderful resources that we post on our webcast web pages. So there will be numerous resources posted, including a document with all the links referenced on the webcast page. And then do visit our website for uh, archives on previous webcasts. I want to quickly thank our WCT supporting members and our annual sponsors that underwrite our events and programs. And we don't have anything scheduled at the end of the year, but do join us back at the beginning of 2018, and we will have a great series to kick off the first quarter. So enjoy your holidays, and thanks for joining us today.